welcome to Moments with Melinda. I'm your host, Melinda Moulton, and today, as my guest, I have Silas Haggerty. Silas, how are you today? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Good to be here, Melinda. Thank you so much for being with me. Well, let me tell my viewers who you are. Um, Silas is the executive director of Smooth Feather Youth, which he founded in 2017. Smooth Feather Youth is a nonprofit that supports positive change and collective creativity for youth through film. So Silas, um, I researched you on the web and spent several hours, uh, and I've known you for a long time too. I've known you for probably 10 years. Uh, we go way back, but there's a, a, a tremendous amount of important work that you've done during your relatively short life. Um, you have created award-winning winning films. Uh, you created a film school, an adventure program for young men and women, youth workshops, a theater, and so much more. So I want to know, Silas Haggerty, where do you get your inspiration? Oh, great question. Uh, where do I get my inspiration? Um, I think it's probably through, well, it's through a lot of things, but the first word that came to me was silence. Um, that... Um, I find that because I don't have like a boss, so to speak, I feel like my boss is like being quiet in the morning. And uh, so call it meditation, but like, it's just the idea of getting quiet, closing my eyes, setting an alarm, sitting down, and then me kind of checking in with something bigger than me and saying like, a lot of times my wife will say, what are you doing today? I'm like, well, I haven't sat yet, so we'll see. And then I'll sit and then I feel like that's kind of where both my direction and inspiration comes from is that silence. Um, so that's the, that's the first, I guess, thing that came to me was silence. Um, there's a lot of things though, my, the youth that I work with, um, my family, my wife, but um, that the silence is the first one that came to me. I think a lot of us could learn a little bit more about silence, my friend. I really <laughs> do. So good for you. Can you tell us a little bit about your childhood? in your life growing up? Yeah. Um, so I'm sitting in an old theater uh, right now that uh, is in my hometown of Keezer Falls, Maine. It's in southwestern Maine. And um, yeah, I grew up here, small little quiet mill town that um, the mill is kind of closed now. But growing up, um, sports were a huge thing for me. Um, soccer, skiing, track, so like very active in that way. Um, that's what got me to University of Vermont was um, the draw to play soccer there. And then, uh, so yeah, I think my childhood was, uh, it's kind of cool that I'm back in my hometown now that um, I live 30 minutes from here, but where I bought this old theater is in my hometown where I would go to school and I still know a ton of people here. Um, and it was kind of that pull at one point in my life in like my late 20s to kind of stop moving so much. I was traveling all over the world, doing a lot of different things. And I kind of got this message, I got to stop moving so much. So I kind of came back to my hometown and bought this old theater um, called the Keezer Falls Theater. That's yeah, built in 1880 and just a really special spot. And I've been renovating it. And um, so, so yeah, that's a little bit about my childhood and uh, how I ended up getting back here. Um, and I know your parents have been really inspirational too. I read quite a bit about um, your, your folks, but who in your life, Silas, provided you with the greatest insight and vision that inspired you to pursue your important work? Hmm. Well, I think that uh, I was just taught, I mean, my parents for sure. Um, I guess I'll start with my dad because I was just talking to him the other night about this, that you know, he really instilled this uh, kind of belief that you could do anything you wanted. Um, and like, you could do anything you wanted. I remember just a couple of nights ago, I was talking to him like, yeah, you remember how, you know, at UVM, I had this crazy idea that I was going to bring you to the band to UVM for something. I just remember having this like dream that I wanted to do that. And it never happened because, you know, bringing you two to a college campus is a <laughs> difficult and expensive task. But just this idea that I, that I believe that I could do it. And I'm sure I could have eventually done it. Um, and I still believe that that could happen. But my dad really kind of instilled that early on that like you can do anything you want. 
Um, so I think that was a very powerful early kind of role modeling messaging early on. Yeah, you want to do it? Like, just go for it. Um, and then my mom, I think, was more reserved like in the sense that she was, I think, helped me a little bit. Like, my dad would maybe heat me up and be like, you can do anything. And then I come, my mom was like cooling me off. Like, I remember when I did well in track, she'd be like, yeah, but you know, there's like other guys in the next state that could totally beat you. So don't <laughs> like always remember that, like kind of like there was this balancing act going on of uh, my mom always kind of um, in a good way, kind of grounding me a little bit. Taught you and, humility. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's a, it's a journey. And I look to my yeah. mom for that yeah. um, every day. So I, I want to talk just for a little bit about Smooth Feather Productions, because that was your original company that you started yeah. in 20, in, in, you know, early on in your career. Can you tell us a little bit about, about Smooth Feather Productions? Yeah, so Smooth Feather Productions was kind of born um, in like the early 2000s, well, yeah, early to mid 2000s after University of Vermont, um, worked in New York, uh, did a lot of traveling, doing films, and then decided I wanted to create my own production company making films for a lot of organizations, a lot of bands, you know, that kind of stuff. And then there was like, then there was a 10 year period with Smooth Feather where we made a film out in South Dakota um, about this uh, powerful 330 mile horseback ride. And that's called Dakota 38. And that took 10 years to make that film. Um, and that's a whole nother uh, conversation about that. One of my film. questions, let's let's jump right into that, Silas. Yeah. That's an important film. And that was when I first met you. Yeah. Was to, um, to uh, sit down and, view that film so why don't you share with our folks what dakota 38 is because that was one of your early films yeah so dakota 38 started when i went to a sweat lodge um on the coast of maine and i'd made a film uh as my senior thesis at the university of vermont um that dealt with a young man who committed suicide and there was a bunch of footage of him right before he passed and his parents who i'd never met said hey can can i invite you to a sweat lodge in maine they were also living in maine um, Jeff and Andrea Galuza, and they said, we got so much healing out of seeing our son in that movie that you made, you know, before he passed, could we meet you? And so I said, yeah. So I went to the sweat lodge because of that was in a sweat lodge for the first time, which totally was a whole nother story, just really powerful. And then they had a friend visiting from South Dakota named Jim Miller, who's a, uh, Lakota healer who was visiting. Um, and he had just had this dream about a 330 mile horseback ride. Um, where he rode in his dream all the way across South Dakota, Minnesota, and then saw 38 men all holding hands, sing a song, and they were hanged at the same time in his dream. And he didn't know what it was. And he said, you know, I just had this super intense dream. And for a while, I was pushing it off because he's a recovered alcoholic, and he didn't want to deal with this dream. But then he started, eventually got up the courage to ask his elders. He was in his 60s, probably at the time. He started asking his elders, you know, what is this dream I had? And they said, that's an actual event where Abraham Lincoln hanged these 38 men. So that was really powerful. So he kind of told me that story about how he had this dream and he wanted to ride out his dream in real life um, now uh, and for healing and reconciliation to kind of heal from a lot of the trauma on both sides um, and to kind of ask for forgiveness for their part in the wars, which was, I was really blown away by like, you know, cause we've done a lot of horrible things to Native Americans for. So for him to say, I want to ask for forgiveness for our part in it for the things that we did um, in those you know, times. It was like, whoa, what an opener. Um, so that's called Dakota 38. And like I said, that was a long life-changing journey of living out there, doing that. And then the model was different in that we just, no one got paid for it. And we gifted that um, free of charge to, um, to the world. So it's on YouTube, you can watch it, Dakota 38. And- uh, Dakota 38, go to YouTube. And, and, and you also showed it, I believe, was it in the Lincoln you showed it down yeah. in Washington, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, we showed it in a lot of wild places from prisons to all sorts of places, yeah. Extraordinary film. So my to my viewers, please go to YouTube and, and um, check this out. Um, it says in your bio that you give your films away. A lot of, I mean, in filmmaking, I think when you do documentaries and films, the money that you make is when you're making the film, but when it's done, then what happens to it? And so talk to us about your, your vision for giving films away. What, what does that mean? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And it's always kind of evolving. But um, yeah, for, uh, for right before making Dakota 38, 
um, I met a really uh, inspiring friend um, named Nipun Mehta, and he um, has an amazing organization called Service Space, and I'm connected to so many great friends out there. And he was the one who really started the seed early on of like, your films are powerful, man. Like, why don't you just give them away? And, uh, and I kind of was living in an expensive apartment in New York at the time and uh, was kind of working my way up through the film world. And then he just inspired me to hit the road. So for two years, I made a bunch of films where I just met up with people that inspired me and then said, hey, let's make a film. And so like my buddy, Zach, Weinstein, who had just broken his back, he's a quadriplegic, we went and hung out in his dorm room and made a film for other quadriplegics. Um, so that's just one example of the films that we made. Um, so that journey um, has still carried on with our nonprofit. We still are totally, all the events are free at the theater with Smooth Feather Youth that we have hove here from the film schools. That's all free. And then we have this awesome Patreon program, which people may be familiar with, but it's like a um, subscription base. Like someone chips in five bucks a month for us and they get a t-shirt and they get to support us. And, um, and it's been amazing to have that kind of a model sustain us and allow us to kind of uh, keep offering the programs that we're offering. So kind of like focus on the service and trust that it'll be supported. And that seems to have worked, which is exciting. It has worked. It has worked. Your, your, your work has been called transformational. And so can you share with my viewers what motivates you to pursue your many endeavors? And can you share my viewers a personal story about transformation that has occurred because of your creative gifts of inspiration? Yeah, so I think the first thing I think of when you say that is um, uh, summer before last, um, there was a young student in a class. We go into the high school uh, and we kind of do a writing workshop for our summer film school that we do. Um, and that's a way to connect with young people that might be interested in making a movie. And uh, we make a movie in one week. They have no experience. They come to the theater one week, they make a movie and then they project, you know, show it to the whole town on a big screen and the theater's packed. And then we have a roll a red carpet rolled out and we're blasting music and fog machines. It's like, it's awesome. It's a really, really powerful thing. Um, so to kind of recruit the, te the teens for that, we go to the local high school and, um, and we asked a question to kind of kick things off. If you really knew me, you would know blank. It's a very, I love that question because you can take it as deep or as you know surface level as you want to go. So they all write for 10 minutes. If you really knew me, you know blank. And one of the young people that we were working with um, writes and I say, does anyone want to share? And she, her name is Olivia. And uh, Olivia says, yeah, I'd like to share. So I said, okay, she seemed really shy. So I was kind of surprised that she volunteered right off the bat. And she said, if you really knew me, you'd know that I cannot make eye contact with people because I suffer from such intense anxiety and I can't have pictures taken of me. And, uh, and it's a struggle. And I, that's what you would know if you knew me that I have this struggle. So that started. And then long story short, that same girl, Olivia ends up being the lead in our movie that summer um, as the main lead character. Um, and then later ends up going on to the Boston International Film Festival and speaking on stage to a whole crowd of people about what that process was like. I mean, this is someone who, you know, a few months prior wouldn't even let someone take a picture of her. And now she's on the stage. And I'm, I, I remember being there like, wow, this is so amazing that she's like, grab the mic. And she's like, yeah, this is what this experience meant to me. And um, so I've been really inspired by like, the the healing like the transformational power of the arts of film i mean the film dealt with a lot of issues that she struggles with in her life so it was like this film as therapy um art as therapy so um and healing it was just really really cool to see that so that's what gets me fired up um stories like that to be able to be a part of that and you know and it wasn't just it was like all of us all the youth the instructors you know it's, it's a big family of people that make that possible so let's talk about that. In 2017, yeah. you started Smooth Feather Youth, which is a nonprofit. Share with us a little bit about this uh, organization that you created. Yeah, so it's uh, it really stemmed from um, you know me wanting to have a film school. I kind of always thought that would be fun to teach young people how to make movies. Um, so that's kind of how it started. Then it also branched into I was on the computer too much, and I was like, 
I got to get outside more. And I was like, well, I should run a youth program where I take them outside more. <laughs> and uh, so that, you know, kind of spurred an excursions program, which we run, um, which takes youth outside, um, connects with nature, um, turn off our phones, that kind of stuff. So, um, and the foundation of everything we run is started with a circle. And that's kind of like the magic of everything um, is sitting down, asking a similar question to that. Like, if you really knew me, you know, blank, something like that to kind of, or even just a weekly check-in, like, how's everyone doing? And we go around the circle and that's kind of the foundation of every program that we do is that circle. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's really for youth, but it's for, you know, for our whole community to thrive. And uh, I remember this, I have a, a friend, Ray Rizzi, Rizzi, who says that um, in order for any uh, culture or animal kingdom to thrive, you need like three generations to be thriving. And anytime you don't have those three generations together, it's not really thriving. So we're, we're focusing on serving youth, but it's really, um, it doesn't feel like it's youth instructor when you're in that circle. It's like, we're all together. Um, and then you have, you know, all those three generations are in our movies with actors to young people to, you know, to, to all the people that come out for the event. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about the film school. And, and in, in 2011, you did purchase the theater in Keezer Falls, Maine. Yeah. With support from your family and friends and you restored it and you use it as your home base. You're sitting there right now today. Mm -hmm. Tell us yeah. about this journey and um, and it's the base for your nonprofit, Smooth Feather. Yeah. So tell us exactly. about this journey. Yeah, so the, the Keezer Falls Theater um, was here. Uh, I was actually looking for a location to screen Dakota 38 in my town. And my dad's like, what about the old theater? And I was like, what old theater? He's like, the Keezer Falls Theater. I'm like, I didn't even know that it was a theater because it was kind of been boarded up and it turned into a furniture warehouse. And uh, so I then inspired by that, went to meet the older gentleman, uh, Phil Welch in my town who owned the theater, talked to him all about like what it was like to run the theater for many, many years. Um, and uh, he, at one point I said, would you ever consider selling it? He's like, no, I don't think I could do that. It'd be too emotional for me. And uh, he's like, but I'll tell you what, just wait till I die. And then my kids will sell it to you for way cheaper than I would anyway. <laughs> and so I said, okay, I laughed and we, uh, you know, and then a couple of years later, he he passed, and um, you know, I waited a few months, and then reached out to um, his daughter Diane, who Diane Wentworth, who I knew know knew well and growing up, and um, so I talked to her. I said, "Hey, I've got this dream to like renovate the theater and have events, do a film school, you know, have concerts, that kind of stuff, and have it be a space for the community to come out to." And she just was incredible, you know, like gave it to me at a ridiculous price and made, made sure I could do it. And she believed in it and she still does, I hope. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's so great to have her at events and I'll often put her on the spot and say, Hey, can you get up on stage? And so, you know, I'm like the latest steward of doing programming, doing events at the theater, but it has a long tradition before me. And I've had so many building parties where over those 10 years, I mean, it was pretty rough when I got it. And, you know, having painting parties, having, you know, um, all sorts of, uh, you know, we've had, you know, Lisa Steele and Julie and Scott in here, um, you know, helping out. So all of these patrons, supporters that have been a part of kind of making this all possible have, you know, showed up and helped us to make the theater what it is. And so I think that sense of ownership from so many different people, like, yeah, I painted that wall. You know, when you walk into the theater, it, it has that um, feeling of it being and community, and community space. And it's so beautiful. So to my mm -hmm. viewers, please go to smoothfeatheryouth.org where you can see- uh, Or smoothfeather.org, yeah. Smoothfeather.org. It's not smoothfeatheryouth.org. Yeah. No, just smoothfeather.org. Smoothfeather.org. Yeah. Smoothfeather.org and check out the website and you can see pictures of the renovation and what a beautiful job you all did. Um, so the young folks that you work with um, at Smooth Feather Youth just completed a film, and I assume this might be the one that Olivia was in, and it was called The Queen of Hearts. Can you tell yes. us about it? Yeah, so that's a, that's a film that we made um, this past uh, February. That's the latest one that's been released. Since then, um, we've made a film uh, over the summer. So our latest movie is called As We Are. Um, but I could also talk about the Queen of Hearts if you have other questions about it, but whichever one you want me to talk about. Talk about your new one. Why not? Okay. Yeah. So now people can see it. Yeah. So um, 
it's going to be released on our website very soon. Um, it's called as we are, and, uh, it's, yeah, it's an incredibly, uh, incredibly powerful short film. Um, and, uh, kind of when I asked, uh, the young director, uh, Tyler Muse, you know, what would you like to have happen is kind of a question that I started to ask him instead of saying, what do you want to make a movie about? I did a couple sessions with him where I talked for maybe two or three hours with him and said, what would you like to have happen? And that was the opening question that led to a long, long conversation, um, which one of the things that he said in that long conversation, which ended up becoming the film is, I'd like to find humanity in those people that we really have trouble finding humanity in. Um, like the people that have done the worst things. How do we find humanity in the people that have done the worst things? So then that kind of pivoted to the question of like, well, what's an example of what would be the hardest thing for you to find humanity in someone? And he said, well, probably if like someone broke into my home and was like, you know, um, harming my family in some way, it would be really hard for me to find humanity and love for that person. So that kind of became the, the backbone, the structure of our movie. Um, and so it involves, you know, an intruder in someone's home and the family coming home and how they deal with that. And it's super intense. It's like, uh, every time I watch it, it's just whew, the intense meter, you know, the, the dial is way up and it's all about how do you, um, deescalate a situation that looks like it's has no, no way out. Um, and so a young person in the film, um, is the person who deescalates the situation. And so, you know, for a young 17 year old to say that that's what they want to make a movie about. I mean, that fires me up. I'm like, man, this is so incredible. It inspired me. And, um, and then the whole town came out and acts in the film and um, it's a really great film. So that's called As We Are. As We Are. Well, you know, in this world today, I think we all need, do need to reach out to people who, who cause pain and, and also create forgiveness within ourselves because with forgiveness and you have healing. So that's incredible. As We Are, smoothfeather.org. For my viewers, um, I will let you know when that, is it really, it's not released yet, right? And, right. Yeah, not quite yet, but it, it'll be in the matter of days. So I don't know when this is going to be released, but um, well, let me yeah, know. we can make it up I'll there. Get, I'll definitely get it up on my social media. So you've also made films for nonprofits. And I just want to let you know that to my viewers to, to let folks know that you did make a, a films for uh, Vermont Special Olympics. And yeah. um, in one of those films, you highlighted my grandson, Rowan, who has speechless <laughs> autism. And he's been an inspiration for so many people with neurodiversity and um, your piece has been seen a lot and it's helped promote the communication tool known as facilitated communication. And that's what gave Rowan his voice. So I wanted to thank you for your work in that because uh, the work you did with Special Olympics was really special and you do this for, uh, for nonprofits. So for that, I honor you. I wanna talk to you, um, you stated in your films that they often have to do with healing. Um, mm -hmm. Can you share a little bit with our viewers what you mean by that? Silas? Yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah. I think they do. Uh, it, it's a common, um, I think it's, it's a common it's an example. I mean, an example is the film that you just created um, and the healing also with Olivia, but that, but that's sort of where you go is you want to create films that create healing in the human spirit. Yeah. And that's, I so, and the circle, the circle, um, when I think about a lot of the films that we make, they wouldn't have the energetic feeling that they have unless we had that circle in the morning. Um, and so we deal with some super heavy things, some super uh, powerful um, messages. And, you know, a couple, one of the days in the film school this summer, you know, we, uh, we had an opening circle where, you um, a lot of people opened up and we were crying in the circle or multiple people crying. And, and uh, you have this connection, this love, this bond in that circle. And, and then like, when you leave that circle, there's this, uh, yeah, it's like a vibration. I don't know how else to say it. Energy, okay. we're energy, we're all energy. Yeah. And, so, you, and you need to explain to my viewers, Silas Haggerty works with youth. So you're working with youth. And I just talked to an educator who said the number one issue for kids and youth in our nation right now is mental health. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And there needs to be healing. And the work that you're doing is, is helping to heal and allow the, the folks you work with. So how do, how do the youth get involved? Do they sign up? 
Is, is there a fee? Is, do you go out and recruit them? How does somebody get involved in your program? Yeah, it's, uh, there's really no formula and it's always, it's, um, it's kind of organic. Um, but some of it's through people that I meet and say, Hey, I'd love to have my kid in that program. Or some, sometimes it's, you know, we just showed as we are the film I was telling you about, um, uh, on Tuesday of this week, um, at the local school. So all the students are watching the film. So, you know, there were a couple students in one of the classes that I was in where I said, Hey, you know, I went up to the teacher afterwards. What's that, what's that person's name? I feel like they could really thrive in the film school. You know, they kind of lit up and raised their hand when no one else was raising their hand and um, kind of connected. So yeah, it's kind of a, a mixture of things and of how, how we find them. They kind of find us, we find them. It's like, a, it's like any relationship. It's kind of like, how do you meet friends? It's like, well, it's, it depends. It's organic. It's, uh, it's karma. And, yeah. And we have friends, you know, like the other day we had a board meeting and, um, you know, we're all you know, a few of us on the board or in our, in the lobby at the theater and our buddy Kane stops in and he's a guy who's kind of like poster child started when he was like 11 with us and has been in a lot of films and just a great, great kid. Um, and so Kane comes in on a scooter. It's like, look, I just got this scooter, man. Like, uh, I still don't have my license, but you can drive a scooter in Maine if you have your permit. So I'm driving my scooter around. So he just like rolls in. And to me, that's the best, you know, sign of success in my mind that a young person sees the light on, pulls in and comes in. He couldn't even stay for that long, but he like gave us a hug and he's like, I got to go. But that's kind of the, the connection. Well, well, today you said you had to move your truck because the people saw your truck in front of the theater to come in and bother you. And so Silas- Well, just you know, say hello, you know. But, yeah, or just say hello or just come in and say hello or want to give you a hug or- Yeah. I didn't mean bother you, but interrupt our interview. Yeah. And yeah, you were yeah. sensitive to that. And you said, I have to go move my truck a couple of blocks <laughs> down the street so people don't see it. So obviously you, you are a beloved human being. Okay, we have, we have climate change. We have uh, the potential end of our democracy. We have these issues for children growing up in this country right now that are really frightening and intense. So as we finish up this interview, Silas, what is your words of, of hope and wisdom for our youth today in this country to be able to move through what is the crisis of humanity, I think, that we've ever seen, which is the crisis of, of, of climate and also um, perhaps the end of our democracy. So what is your words of wisdom for the youth today? Um. I think that all I can really do is speak for myself. And I would just say that, um, you know, doing what makes me come alive is really what I try and focus on. Um, and so what, what gets me excited in the morning, what gives me that like tingle on the back of my neck that says like, wow, I want to do more of this. Um, and so whatever that is, um, that's kind of how, that's how I strive to follow that follow that excitement, follow that fire in my spine, that like excitement that makes me want to get up in the morning and, uh, and live and be alive. So um, I think, and then that's going to ripple out in ways that we have no control over. But if I can focus on that, then I think it's going to, um, that's kind of an empowered place that I try and be in. So for our, so for our youth, your, your words of wisdom for them to get through their day, they just got through COVID. They're dealing yeah. with climate. They're dealing with, um, you know, Many are, you know, living in poverty and struggling, and also the fate of our, of our democracy. I mean, our our children today are facing a lot that um, that I think in my generation uh, we were hiding under our desk because of nuclear war. But at the end of the day, we weren't having climate change. So I'm just, I, I I'm going to just say this for you because I'm I'm going to go to both of us so we can see both of us here. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm going to say it for both of us. I think the work that you do does help the, the, the young people that you're working with to face their world and to understand uh, what it is in their world and, their, their, and how they have to live in this world in order to face the issues and to be, a, be a, a change maker. And I think you do that in the work that you do with these kids. Wouldn't you say and, that? Yeah, and I, and I think it, um, it's, a, it's completely um, reciprocal because um, a lot of times when I'm feeling down, when I'm feeling disconnected, when I'm feeling depressed, I think, okay, I should get a circle together and I should connect with some youth and let's put on an event for the town. And so, and that brings me out of, you wherever know, you're, wherever. wherever I'm struggling with that connection. And so a lot of times, like there was this quote that I read that was really helpful to me. It was like the, 
the de the definition of suffering is believing that you're separate from the whole. So when you think that you're separate from the whole, that's suffering. And so a lot of times in my life, I'll start to feel like it's on my shoulders or it's me. And then when I can like connect myself to the whole, get in a circle of people, that's when all of a sudden the weight's taken off. It's like, okay, we're all just connected. We're all here. We're all trying to do the best job we can, do what makes us come alive together in service of other people. Um, and so that's, uh, that's what kind of keeps me excited. What a beautiful message. Well, our, we've come to the end of our show. And to my viewers, Silas Haggerty, what a treat to spend time with you. And mm -hmm. if I get over your way, I will come to your theater. <laughs> Come to the theater. Well, absolutely. <laughs> I just started. We have three couches, I, uh, I just, myrtles started. in the back and rosies. So there's these big velvet couches you can sit on. And well, velvet is my thing. Um, <laughs> and I and I just started a, a local theater group in my town called the Huntington Players. So oh, we've awesome. been producing um, productions here. So to you, well, you my on the friend, road, if you go on the road, we'll host you. <laughs> wow. Well, I will. I will think about that. Um, so to my viewers, I just want to thank you for being with us today with Silas Haggerty. 